We're going to learn all the details of Advanced General Medical Practice program from a professor played a significant role in reforming dental private higher education. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you today? Um, I'm pleased to be able to talk to this number of the cream of the society in Turkey. Um, we, we consider doctors are the cream of the cream of the society. And um, I'm really pleased to be able to join you today in Istanbul um, on a Sunday afternoon, which is your break. It's all right. You should be at home now with families and friends and enjoying your end of the week. Right. Um, so I highly appreciate you with us today. So I'll, I'm, I'm going to take you in a journey <coughs> talking about our college and then talking about um, the opportunity that I'm bringing for you, if, if that's your interest, um, if this is the, the, the pathway that you would like to take. So it might be good for you, it might not be good for you, and I'm happy to answer questions afterwards, whether that's a personal question on the side or in the room, if you would like to open this later on. So um, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about myself, first of all. My name is Maher Al-Masri. I'm not a doctor, right? I'm a dentist by qualification. Um, I went to the UK 25 years ago, finished my dental degree from Damascus, and I have done all my training in uh, maxillofacial surgery, so head and neck surgery in, in the UK. And I did a master's degree and a PhD degree at the London University. And then I, I was awarded a scholarship in Germany to train on um, grafting augmentation procedures. Then I went back to the UK and I was teaching in the academic sector since that time. I did an MBA as well in higher education management. And I am one of the founders of the College of Medicine and Dentistry, where I, I, I lead now as a CEO and the dean. And it's, uh, the college is the first independent college in the UK to teach dentistry and medicine on a private basis. All other dental schools and medical schools are public institutions. Ours is the first private one. Having said that, there is a, an, another undergraduate medical school that is teaching only undergraduate medicine. It's called Buckingham University. They don't teach postgrad yet. We are the only, the first and only private dental school in the UK, and first and only private medical postgraduate college as well. Right. Um, so, so that's myself. So I have an, a PhD degree, an MBA, MSc, and dentistry degree, and I lead the college. And we, we go back. To our history to 2013, that's eight years ago, when we started within the dentistry, and then we diversified and expanded into medical programs. Um, we have state-of-the-art facilities, from hospital, dental hospital to simulation centers, le lecture rooms, and uh, all the other facilities in central Birmingham. We also teach on uh, distance learning and uh, outreach centers in London and other areas in the UK. We have a student-centered education, which means that we care about the student. We make it very personable education. We make it, um, our, edu our education is focused on what the student want, what each student want, and his career where he wants to be in one year, two years, three years, five years, and ten years' time. And we do have regular communication with our graduates and alumni to see if they have achieved uh, their outcomes or not yet. 
And quality assurance is uh, our strength in a way that all the students and the graduates' opinions, we take it very seriously and we improve accordingly. Obviously, we would uh, we'll be, we'll take the world in education. We want to be the outstanding college with an inclusive community, uncompromised excellence in education, focus on innovation, leadership, and employability. And I will talk about employability in a bit. The mission is, again, uncompromised excellence, innovative way in teaching, so innovation is a big time, and providing clinical leaders, which is a big item that is important in clinical medicine and clinical dentistry, which we currently lack. So we focus on getting the future clinical professionals, what skills and competencies they require to progress what skills and competencies they require today, in five years, in 10 years, and in 20 years time, even if they want to leave the clinical profession and they become leaders in hospitals and managers of big healthcare entities. Statistics, our statistics, at least 97% of our faculty, they have a master's degree we educate students from over 57 countries around the globe. They come to us in Birmingham. And we are the most international college in the UK in that sense, in dentistry and in medicine. In 2019, we're doing another new statistics to prove this, but we, in 2019, we reached to over 80% of the dental professionals in the UK, communicating with them. Until now, we finished over 300 dental MSCs and medical MSCs. Since 2019, we prepared more than 250 professionals and we gave them jobs. We delivered education to over 100 DCPs and in jobs. And since inception, since the start, we communicated and contacted over 200,000 healthcare professionals across the globe, internationally, which is significant. Obviously, our goals, de delivering quality with excellence, nurturing, I'd like to stop, and I'd like to focus on the phrase nurturing. Nurturing is a big phrase, is a big word, and if you want to Google what nurturing means, or if you're competent in English and you know what nurturing means, you will see nurturing is bring, bringing somebody up. It's similar to, similar to when you look, you look after a child and nurture him to become an adult. Nurturing is a big meaning, and it informs and indicates to looking after someone until he reached to his aims and the purpose of his engagement with us. So we're not a regular college. We're not a normal education provider. We focus on the career. We focus on the aim and purpose of the students and the candidates, the people who join our college we consider them part of the college. And we say to them, our college and your future are very much connected. And many of our alumni and graduates, they stay with us. We encourage them to stay with us, not only to advise them and give them mentorship, but also to use their skills in nurturing their successes the new intake of students, the new intake of trainees. So that's what we do, and that makes us a very special college. So nurturing is a big thing, and that's what we focus on. And then aspiring to the highest standard of ethical and professional 
integrity, and that's required not only within Turkey, and I know that it's required in Turkey, but it's also required in the West, in the UK, to a different level, required in the UK to a level that matches the culture in the UK. We do acknowledge that ethical and professional standards exist in Turkey, similar to any other country, or maybe more. But the UK has a separate culture and a different culture, and they perceive things differently than other countries. They perceive how the medical doctors speak to the patient in a different way. And I will touch on those matters later on in my presentation. So we, we make the, the, the, the, the students, the graduates, the alumni, people who join the college, we make them understand, really understand what we mean by aspiring to the highest standard in the way how the UK wants it, which might be different than the one in Turkey. It's not less, it's not more, but it's different. And then more importantly is the career support. And we mean a lot by the career support, whether that's related to the part-time students that we have. And we have done lots of statistics on the employability of these people, part-time, <laughs> and the annual income they bring home every year before joining the course and after joining or after finishing the course. And we have statistics to show that it, it, it does at least double the annual income because they learn skills it's, that is required in the current times of specialization within the disciplines, whether that's dentistry or medicine. So that's for part-time. And we change the, the, the way and we change the life of those who join us on a full-time basis. We change the level of life, we change, it's a life-changing event for them after they finish the program. And I have examples and success stories which I will talk about a, a bit later as well. And we foster commitment to the quality of care for the best healthcare systems in the world. Obviously we have supporting pillars, excellence in education, as I mentioned earlier, with 97% um, of the faculty with the masters, PhDs, and professional education. Innovation in internationally relevant education, whether that people would like to stay in the UK or live abroad, the United States, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, go back to the Middle East, go back to Turkey, India, wherever. It's internationally relevant education. And driving high impact research when you finish the master's degree, and many of the research that we do is published in peer reviewed journals and in um, international conferences. And we do deliver at least 100 dissertation per year, which is significant. And more importantly is enhancing employability and strategic partnership. Because think about it, why are you here today? You want to have, to have a better life, you want to have, to have a better job, you want to enhance your employability, your career. And that's what we do. We are here and we exist to make you achieve that goal in a very well designed, structured, focused, scheme, very well designed, focused program. And how we do it is our purpose. How we do it is our game. And how we do it is our approach. So we have um, cl close relationships with the employers, within dentistry for example. We have uh, contracts and agreements to supply my dentist, a, a big corporate in the UK that owns 700 dental practices in the UK, all over the UK. 
They employ thousands of dentists and dental care professionals, and they rely on us in providing them with workforce. Similarly, we have close connections with the NHS, many private hospitals, and many um, primary care providers, general practices, to provide workforce for doctors and associate physicians, etc. And we speak the language of the employers. We know what they want. And we deliver education to you to shine and achieve when you have the interview with the employers. So they will say, this is the person that I want. We became known to the employers that we deliver that training to students that they trust us without even interviewing our candidates. They take our reference very seriously because we speak their language, because we know what they want. And we train our candidates in the same way. I have many success stories in areas of dentistry mainly. An example, a student with the name of AK, he joined our college in January 21. So it's less than one year ago. He's, he's finished uh, his license approach and he delivered um, his dissertations, etc. He's finishing the program very soon. So it's a one year full time program. He came from Egypt. Just before coming here, he came to see me in, in my office and he said, Professor Al Masri, I'm, I'm really glad to have met you. Less than a year ago, I joined the program. Before joining the program, my income was 10 pounds per day, 10 sterling pounds a day. How much is that in Turkish? 14, 1500 a day. Uh, sorry, for, for, uh, 150 per day. That's Turkish money. That's that how much he was receiving per day before joining the program. And whilst he's doing the, the, the, the, the program, his study with us, his MSc with us, he was offered a part-time employment, two days per week, and he was doing 400 pounds per day. He's finishing the master's degree th this December. Um, he's, he's got a job offer for January start, and on a full-time employment, with a salary over 50,000 pounds per year. That's one of many success stories that we have. And he would keep communicating with us because we need him to work with us to support his successes, in a way, this, the coming cohort of students. And similar items within the medicine, from facial aesthetic people to aesthetic uh, medicine, etc. So let me come to medicine now. So why we decided to move towards medicine? Obviously, it's a cream of the cream of the society everywhere. You do really well in Turkey, you do really well in the Middle East, you do really well in the United States, and you would do really well in the UK. So why we decided to go into medicine? Which is an important question. I mean, I live in, in the UK for 25 years already. I know the culture. There is a huge shortage of yourselves in the UK. We have shortage of doctors for different reasons. One of the reasons is the pandemic. Other reasons, including or might include the Brexit. So many doctor, uh, uh, many medical professionals and doctors, they left the UK because of Brexit. They're European or they have partners who are Europeans or the Brexit does not suit them. So we have shortage of doctors. We had shortage of doctors previously, but this gap is, it did get bigger, and now is getting bigger to a level of crisis. So we have shortage of doctors. And that shortage is acute. And even if the UK today decided 
we will teach more doctors in the UK. They need 10 years at least to graduate the new intake of doctors. Because it's a long journey. You've done it. You know it. But historically, the UK is known to recruit medical doctors and dental, doc dental professionals and dentists. It's known to recruit them from international. So the international market is a big asset to the United Kingdom in terms of healthcare. And the statistics, it shows us if we decide as a United Kingdom, if we decide to stay within the current practice and not do a major step to improve the healthcare and recruit doctors, a major step, we are in deficit in 20 years' time from now, we are in deficit of 80,000 doctors. It's a major number. It's a huge number. That will destroy the healthcare if a big step is not implemented. So hence, we move towards medicine. There is a big phrase called ING, International Medical Graduates, and that's something that the UK relies on for hundreds of years. And we know, we know that the UK has done this before, and they want to do it again. We know the statistics that tells us the percentage of foreign doctors or international medical graduates in the UK that enhances the medical se sector. We know this percentage. And that's registered in the OECD organization, as Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. You can look it up in the, in the website. It's an organization that works to build better policies for better lives. And they informed us of the current ratio, which is 2.8 per 1,000 that we have in the UK, and the average that we need to achieve, which is 3.7 per 1,000 that exists in the EU. And they informed us that in 2043, if we don't do a major step, we will be over 80,000 doctors short in our profession, culturally. And we know the statistics of the importance of the international medical graduates. So one in every three secondary care doctors are international graduates. These are not the ones who are taught in the UK. They taught overseas. They are trained overseas and then they move to the UK to enhance the healthcare sector. And the UK is one of the countries that has the highest levels of overseas doctors. And that was published in the, in the OECD organization. We know where they're located. Percentage-wise, we, we know what the IMG, where the IMG workers like to work. We know where they're located, and there are lots of graphs to tell us. For example, in London, is is more IMGs than than North East and um, and Yorkshire. We have more IMGs in Birmingham, Manchester, for example. But there is vacancies everywhere, not only in in, in London. There's vacancies in all the areas within the NHS in the UK. And the, ho and the shortage is not only in hospitals, but also at GP level. And the waiting list on the GPs is enlarging, is getting bigger, and the gap is getting bigger. And there is a target, and has been a target for the government, to, to recruit 5,000 doctors as GPs. And they failed to achieve this. And now there's a larger target. That's that target of 5,000, it's until 2020. But the target in 24 or 25 is another 6,000 GPs. And if we don't do a major step again, a major intervention, we will not achieve this target. So the purple line is the current situation. The green line is the previous target that the UK did not achieve. And the blue line, 
Are the colors right in here? Yes. The blue line is the new target for 2024, which hopefully we will achieve by international medical graduates. So we need you. There is a place for you. But you need to have a license to practice. So what do you need to get that license? You need to do the, the relevant exam. And I'm sure if you thought about the UK, you know what a PLAB is. And that's the Professional and Linguistic Assessments Board, which assesses your ability to practice in the UK. And that's not, that's not a medical assessment only. It's medical and linguistic and professional and ethical assessment of your readiness to see patients in the UK. And that soon will change to what we call it UK MLA, so the United Kingdom Medical License Assessment, which again includes professional assessment, linguistic assessment, etc. And we know the dates of those assessments I mean, within COVID, and hopefully we will increase those assessments after COVID or just soon after COVID. And we have communicated with the GMC to be recognized as an assessment center within the college. So our graduates can be assessed internally for UK MLA or the PLAM. We are communicating seriously with the GMC for this. And the current PLAM is two parts. PLAB 1 and PLAB 2. PLAB 1 is more theory, or it's only theory. And PLAB 2 is uh, an OSCE, that's Objective Structured Clinical Exam, in which you go through a number of stations and you spend a few minutes in each station. And each station is talking to you about one clinical scenario, and you need to do a set of activities or a set of exercises within that clinical scenario, whether that is five minutes, six minutes, or eight minutes. And it's tough. So the OSCE is not an easy assessment because there is, there is an expectation that you need to do a lot with that few minutes, within that, that few minutes. You will need to tick the boxes of what they want you to show. You need to demonstrate what they want to see in that five minutes. So it's not only about your knowledge of the, of the case, is not about your knowledge of the disease or the, the illness that, of that patient. Because you will see a patient in front of you, an actor who's, who's acting as a patient. And you need to extract information from the actor and provide a plan. In some other uh, uh, scenarios, in some other stations, OSCE stations, you will need to do an activity, for example, taking your blood pressure or making or doing a suturing exercise, stitching exercise on a model, or maybe intubate a patient, or put a venflow line, open a venous line. So each station has separate activity, and we teach you in our courses on how to pass these stations within the required time. We teach you how to complete the exercise required, ticking all the required items that they expect you to do. Because you might forget one item, and that one item is a killing item, because it will destroy your exam. You fail it because you didn't consider this is an important item. We know the stations, we know what we expect in the stations, and we provide you with the competencies required to complete all the items in that station successfully. So that's PLAB 2. And within, if I go back to the slide, the PLAB 2 is assessing three important areas. How to gather and collect information from the patient and make assessment. And clinical skills and management, so assessing how you gather the information, and then the clinical assessment and clinical skills, and interpersonal skills like communication. And from our experience, and probably is published everywhere, 
that many of the failures are not related to people who are not able to do clinical diagnosis of a disease, but it's related to interpersonal skills in the way they did not communicate properly with the patient, answering the required questions, taking the required consent, making the patient decide rather than you decide for him. And that's a different culture, a different way of thinking from where you are currently, when you are the boss in that practice. You're not the boss anymore. It's the patient who is the boss. He decides what he wants to do, but you illustrate everything to him. I'm saying it's different because I come from a similar background myself to the Turkish culture. with no devalue of the Turkish culture, but it's different. So PLAB2 is about uh, the communication, it's about clinical examinations that um, you might do on a simulated patient, a model, or on, a, on an actor, and how you interact with the actor. This might be somebody who is in, in front of you in the room, or it might be over the phone. So they give you a phone, and there's an actor on the other side of the phone, and you communicate with that patient over the phone. And there are information that you need to give to the patient, and information that you need to take from the patient. And the information is different when the patient is over the phone than when he is with you in the room because you haven't examined the patient. So in each case scenario, the level of information that you give and you receive is different, and you need to make decision and assessment accordingly. And we train you on all of this. Some, some other consultation happens on Zoom, for example, or over a, a video conference. How do you do it? And what level of information you provide? And what do you extract from the patient? And do you decide or you don't decide? And what do you say to the patient? Do you say the diagnosis or probable diagnosis? So lots of information in this. In some cases, you, you'll be asked to conduct a physical examination using a model or a mannequin. I will tell you what to do in that examination. You communicate with the model and you tell the model what you're going to do. So full details of each scenario, we train you on how to pass that case. And the practical skills, performing a cannula, calculating a drug dose, giving a prescription, injection, suturing, etc. So clinical skills can be assessed or will be assessed. And finally, it's the interpersonal skills. And how do you explain this to the patient? The diagnosis, how do you ask him to do investigations? Involving the patient in the decision making, making the patient decide. Communicating with the relatives, whether they are, whether the patient is an, is an adult or a child. And when do you communicate with the patient or not, or, this, or to communicate with the guardian of the patient, and who takes the responsibility. All of those aspects, communication with other healthcare professionals, referring the patient to a cardiologist, or referring the patient to uh, taking an x-ray, whether that's verbal referral or in writing. Communicating or breaking bad news, so how do you tell a patient you have a cancer? All of these items, taking a consent, what we call it an informed consent to do a clinical assessment or to do a clinical procedure for an invasive or a simple procedure. And when, when do you do the procedure without a consent? In a way, you don't need a consent in some cases. Dealing with angry patients and anxious patients, and you will have those in an OSCE station, and you will have those in real life. 
and how do you deal with them? Giving instructions on a discharge from hospitals. So when do you discharge a patient? Or discharge him from the GP? You don't need to see me again. Or come and see me in a one year time. If you follow these instructions, unless you need me for something else. All the medical legal aspects of those items and those topics. And then giving advice on the lifestyle and instructions on smoking cessations and drugs and alcohol and other lifestyle events and, and uh, instructions for other lifestyle habits. And health promotion and talking about risk factors in life for the best interest of the patient. And what is your responsibility if you don't do it? What's the obligation on you if you don't do it? And how do you communicate this with the patient and how you document it in the medical notes? All of these items which are important, not only for the exam, but also the important in your future life as a doctor in the UK. Because if you don't do it, even if you have the license, your license will be at the scale that it might be withdrawn from you if a patient complains against you that you haven't delivered the relevant information to him or to his family. So many aspects. So what we need, we need doctors, international medical graduates. They will do the PLAB exam currently. We expect them to do the UK MLA later on, which is um, another move from the PLAB, but similar to the PLAB. We are communicating with the GMC on the structure of the UK MLA to start delivering the training for the UK MLA. We know that the UK MLA, it will not only be applied on international medical graduates, but it will also apply on UK graduates. But the UK medical school will integrate the UK MLA exam within the final year exam of the medical schools within the UK. You don't have it, and we are communicating currently with the international medical schools to integrate this to make it suitable for the final year exam for those who are interested in coming to the UK. Because it will be similar. It will, be, it will make life easier for those who want to come to the UK. And, and there is the English language assessment. Because you won't be able to do the PLAB without demonstrating that you have appropriate level of English. And currently there are two tests, IELTS, which is general English, and the OET, which is occupational English test. From our experience, for you as doctors, the OET is a lot easier and it's more focused on your discipline. So the, the English assessors or the English exam will be within the medical discipline. It's not going to be talking about astronomy, for example. So if I ask you to write a short essay about astronomy, you will struggle. I will struggle. An English person will struggle with the terminology, with the way how you design it. But if I ask you to write an essay about a patient who came to you with a painful knee, for example, will be able to write an essay about it for me. So OET is a lot simpler and more focused, and we are quite happy that it's accepted by the GMC. We know the dates of the OET. We communicate with the OET assessment team. We have teachers who teach the OET, and that is included in our training. So we train our candidates on the OET exam. We assess them initially. We take them in a journey to upskill and have an upgraded level in the OET and how to pass the exam. So we, we know when the exam is scheduled, when we know when to apply for that specific exam, and we know when the results will be published, and then when the results are published and you pass, we know how to progress, progress you and register, register you in the PLAB or the UK MLA. And the OET is four sections, listening, reading, writing, and speaking, but it will be in your own discipline, so in medicine. And we know what, what you need to, to be able to do the exam. 
what grade you need within the OAT to do the PLAB exam, which is within the A and B. If you get a C plus or C, you would you might be able to do it within dentistry, but with the, without within not within medicine. So you need an A or a B, and we know how to get you to that grade. So within all of this, we established two programs within the college. We established a short six months program, we called it Life in and Work in the UK for Doctors, six months intensive program, and we established a one year full-time MSc program. They both happen in the UK, both are full-time, the first one is six months, and it's focused on PLAP. The second one is an MSc degree, again is focused on the PLAP, but it has research, also research modules to be able to grant you within MSc. So the first one, it gives you the PLAP. If you pass the PLAP, you will get a job. So we focus the first program on the PLAP. The second program, we also focus on the PLAP. So it's your option to choose the six months or the one year. The six months program is focused but you don't get a university degree with it. It's an exam-focused program on a six months duration. And that's what is called Life and Work in the UK for Doctors. The second one, it does have all of the items of the first one. But we add on this program all the research items that are required to complete an MSc degree. So let me talk about the six months program. It's focused on establishing a career in the UK as a doctor. We give you a short six months visa to the UK to complete this program, intensive program. We teach you life in the UK as, as a doctor, including all medical legal aspects, professionalism, communication skills, we teach you the OAT aspects to pass the OAT exam, the English exam. So we have a team who delivers the English exam. And we have a team who delivers the PLAB assessment and PLAB examination. We focus you on the PLAB, PLAB 1 and PLAB 2. We register you in the exam, PLAB 1 and PLAB 2. And we introduce you to the UK practice, all the interpersonal skills. You will do all of this within the six months. And we teach you how you conduct an interview for a job, for a successful interview. And we offer you the job at the end. So we have communication, we have connections, we have agreements with the relevant employers. They trust our grad graduates, they interview you, and then they provide you with a job. So we guarantee the job for you when you pass the plan. So that's a six months program. The MSc in Advanced General Medical Practice, it's a one year full time. It has all the earlier aspects. Plus you study Advanced General Medicine. And you get an MSc degree. And we get you to focus on the PLAB. So the PLAB is still a core topic within that one year but we add to it advanced general medical practice and we add to it the research and you finish an MSc within that intensive one year full time, in which we aim that you register with the GMC and to get a guaranteed job and then the government will give you two years work permit after finishing the MSc. So you'll be able to slot in the job immediately when you finish the MSc. And that's what my student did. All my students, they received a, a two-year work permit in the UK after finishing the MSc. And that's a prospect for a career in the UK. So when you finish the program, it will open the, the door for you to work and live in the UK. The, it's a modular. Both of them are modular programs. Both of them will have basic sciences, biomaterials, health promotions, examination of a patient, diagnosis and treatment, 
clinical skills, holistic multidisciplinary approach to patient care. We teach you all about the NHS, that's the national health system. We teach you clinical governance, management and administration. Obviously, we deliver English language tuition and training to you. That's within the life and, life and work, that's in the UK, that's within the six months program. We deliver all of this again for the MSc, but we add to it research modules, one, two, and dissertation, research dissertation, because you would need to publish a book, which is a dissertation, and we do that for you. We do it with you. And then we mentor you, we give you full mentorship to the application process in the GMC. And we give you the mapping exercise and completion of the application form. And after you, finishing, you finish the program, we give you full mentorship to get the job and to move from a job to another job and to succeed in your life after finishing the program, in your professional life. So you finish the lab, what's the next step? You either work in the hospital or you work in the GP, as a GP. And both require training. So in the hospital, there is um, two ways, surgical training or internal medicine training or medical training. And for medical training where we have larger gap, so we have basically shortage in the medical training, huge shortage, you need to do an IMT, that's internal medicine training program, core level training for all medical specialties, that's two or three years. But when you are doing this training, you are a, a remunerated uh, professional, you are receiving a salary, and it's a significant salary, it's not a, it's not a low salary. You are training, but you're receiving a good revenue on an annual basis. You will be able to sustain your living and support your family. A good support. So before you subspecialize in cardiology, gastronephrology, etc., you rotate on a number of medical specialties within the internal med medical training. And the UK divided it into two groups. Medical specialties number one, medical specialties number two, and the IMT for group number one is three years, and the IMT for group number two is two years. That's before you embark on the subspecialization training as a specialist registrar. But again, I re emphasize that during, during doing this training, you receive a good salary. So what's the eligibility for this? Number one, you need the lab exam. You're not, you need to get registered as a doctor. If you're not registered as a doctor, you will not be able to do it. And then you'll be ready to take the IMT and you apply. And you need a postgraduate. So after you finish the medical school or the GMC registration, you need a one year experience. But what is very important here, your medical experience back home as a doctor will count towards this. So we will prepare you to supply or to apply for the exemption of that experience after the GMC because your experience in Turkey will count for this. What I would like to focus on here, this training pathway is not a race. You should grow in this steadily, a step by step. You, you need to take all your steps to gain the skills, not only clinical skills, but also academic skills, research and audit, teaching presentations, and personal skills, communication, management leadership, team involvement, organization, and respect the values of property and commitment to specialty. You need to grow those within you. Because if you don't grow these skills, you will struggle later on in your profession in the UK. Because they will ask you about them. You need to demonstrate these skills. We deliver that training to you within the PLAB training. But you need to grow this training as you, in, as you improve and as you uh, 
uh, mature within the training pathway in the UK, within any specialty. So it's not a race to finish it. After you finish the IMT, you take uh, the MRCP, and then you enter the specialist training three and specialist training four, and then you finish the specialty training and you become a specialist. But all this pathway is an employment pathway. You receive a salary, and it's a significant salary. You'll be able to sustain living in that salary. Similarly, if you want to practice as a GP, you need to do the same. So it's a specialist training, and the requirements are very similar to enter into GP specialist training. And many of our students and our candidates, they have done this because they would like to have an easier life as a GP. And it's not less revenue, it's not less annual income. Because when you work as a GP, you work as a partner in the GP. And that GP practice will become a business for you and your partners. And you need to grow your personal skills, communication, adjust behavior, conceptual thinking, problem sol solving, em empathy and sensitivity, all the skills, interpersonal skills that are required to act as a GP in the UK. And I intentionally decided to put you the pay scale that the UK pay for junior doctors, for trainees. And it can start from 40,000 pounds and in the ST1 and ST2. And it can go up to 54,000 pounds. And if you do it on call, overnight duties, you can receive an additional 6,000 pounds per year. So it's not a low salary. That's ST1, ST2. And ST3, ST4, You can go, or you can start from 50,000 pounds and you can go up to 70,000 pounds. And if you're doing on-call duties, you can receive additional seven to 8,000 pounds, which is again significant. And the ST6 and ST8, the still trainees, starts from 54 and can go up to 80,000 pounds. And when you finish and you work as a consultant, you finish the training, you finish your specialty and work as a consultant, you can start from 78,000 pounds and you can go up to 107,000 pounds in the NHS. And if you're doing private, you can do similar figure, so you can go another 100, and if you're doing only one day per week on a private hospital, you can earn another 50,000 pounds. So in general, all consultants, they are at the level of income of about 200,000 pounds per year. Half of that is from NHS and the other half from private consultations in private hospitals. So that's the level of income for trainees. Now what we have for you to supply the UK with the medical doctors, we established the two programs. The first one is the six months program. Establish a career in the UK as a doctor. We give you a short time, a short visa of six months. You come to Birmingham, we train you on English. Even we start the English training before you come to the UK. You finish the OAT and then PLAB 1 and PLAB 2. We train you on them finish the training, you get the PLAB, you, you set the PLABs, we support you in setting the PLABs, teach you on the UK practice, we teach you how to do successful interviews and then we get you into real time interviews and we get you a guaranteed job offer. And that program is six months program and we priced it at 15,000 pounds. So that's the UK Live and work in the UK as a doctor. It's a diploma program. It's not a university degree. The other one is a university degree, which is starting in September 22. That will take place most likely in Northern Ireland, not far from Belfast. An intensive residential one-year program in which we deliver all the items that I mentioned earlier, 
plus we teach you advanced general med medical practice, you get an MSc, you do research, and you finish with a two-year visa from the UK government, and the price for this program over one year is 30,000 pounds. So that's the two programs that we have. I was asked to stop for break. So is it 10 minutes break? Do you want me to give him 10 minutes break, yes? Okay, so you have a, a comfort break and the drinks outside and then we come back and prepare for me your questions. I'm happy to answer. Okay, see you in a bit. Thank you. Kısa bir kahve molasının ardından sunumun ikinci kısmı için tekrar salonda buluşacağız değerli katılımcılarımız. Sunum aynı zamanda sorularınızla sonlanacak. Lütfen sorularınızı sunum sonuna saklayın. 10 dakika sonra görüşmek üzere. afternoon. Um, so again, we're talking about the two programs. The first program is a six-month program. It aims on the PLAB and the PLAB only and includes English training. And I will show you the timeline for this. And it, and it talks about um, a career in the UK as a doctor from English training to PLAB 1, PLAB 2, focused on uh, UK practice, medical legal aspects, etc., all of those items, what you need to practice in the UK, and it does provide you with job skills to do successful job interviews and um, guarantee a job with, for you within one year of finishing the plan. I was asked a question by one of your, um, one of the team in, in or one of the doctors in the room. I was asked. I have friends who passed the PLAB and they're struggling to finish the, or to get a job. Yes, I agree. It's, it's, again, it's not only about finishing the PLAB. It's not only about finishing the PLAB. The employers would need to see that you are trained to the UK standard. It's about reorient your mindset to the UK practice and employers trust our graduates in that way. So the program that we provide you, we reculture you towards UK practice because you need to be a, sale, a, a safe practitioner. You need to be a safe doctor. And that's what they need to see in you. And that's why we guarantee the job for you because you've done a full UK orientation program within an intensive six months or intensive one year. The second course that, so the first one is starting at the end of February, so after a few weeks. The second one is starting in September 22, and that will be Northern Ireland. The first one is in Birmingham, but the second one is in Northern Ireland. And the second one is a one year full time, MSc degree, you finish the MSc, you finish the plan, you get a two-year visa, in work visa in the UK, two years work permit in the UK. And you study advanced general medicine as well. And you get an M MSc, so three letters next to your name, and you will work in any job, to be honest, because of that degree. Because not many doctors, they have MSc's in the UK. So the time frame, if we consider at day zero, when you start the program here, before starting the program, we train you on the OAT. We assess your English level. If you have not had an English assessment, whether that's the OAT or IELTS, we do the assessment for you. 
and we tell you, you need that level of English tuition and training, and we provide you with this until you be able to sit the OET exam. We provide you with the training to say, now it's the time that you sit the OET exam. And we anticipate this to be probably one month after starting the program because it's an intensive training. So you start, you start the program with us and we start with the OET that we started before the program, we start teaching you on PLAB 1. So PLAB 1 teaching will start from the first day you arrive to the UK and will take place for about two months until you finish PLAB 1. And then PLAB 2 starts in parallel to PLAB 1. So you will do both PLAB 1 and PLAB 2 later on. So initially you would do OET and PLAB 1 and then finish OET, we start you with PLAB 1 and PLAB 2 together. And we continue PLAB 2 until you finish the PLAB 2. And then we teach you on job interviews and we give you career advice until you find a job. And we guarantee a job for you. And after finishing the program, we keep giving you mentorship training and mentorship support until you have the final stage, and you, which is basically you reach the final job that you need. And then we ask you to support your successors in giving mentorship. Obviously, even that support will be, will be a job. So we will provide you with a job opportunity to work with us to support your successes. So it's a well-structured program over six months. And that program, over six months, but it's stretched over one year when you do the full MSc. So the same program will stretch over one year when you do the MSc, but you will have with it research training and research education, and you will do a full dissertation to qualify with a full MSc with us. So that's a time frame that we take with you to support you until you find your job. Uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. Uh, and uh, my question is that uh, I'm a pulmonologist, chest disorder expert. I want to be an allergist. Uh, first question, how can we ensure uh, the equivalence of the specialist doctor and how long uh, does an allergy specialist take? Uh, thanks uh, for a play. Um, thank you. The chest, I mean, I must admit that I don't know answers to all questions. And I don't want to give answers that I'm not sure of, okay? But in general, if you are a specialist in, the, in Turkey, within one discipline, you will need to collect all your portfolio that includes the training that you had with the syllabus and curriculum that you received. Each school and each training provider has a curriculum and syllabus, and it's a big document. So you will need to get this and translate it into English and have your logbook and portfolio of evidence of all the work that you, ha you have received, all the training that you have received, and all the work that you've done. So if it's surgical procedures, you have your portfolio of surgical procedures, logbook. Because after you finish the PLAB, you will need to make an application to the GMC and the Royal College and say, I'm a specialist in my own country. And I can provide evidence that I'm a specialist. 
So you apply for a specialty status and most likely you will get it if you have received the appropriate training in Turkey. That is equivalent to the UK training. Most likely you will receive the specialty status. Failing that, they might say to you, we will accredit some parts of your training, but you lack some aspects of the training. For example, you haven't done enough surgical procedures of this. Your portfolio of evidence or your syllabus is focusing on some certain procedures and it lacks some others. And we would like you to provide us evidence of this. So you'll do, for example, another six months in a training in, in, somewhere else, even in the UK, and you provide the evidence for this. Failing that, you can still work in your own discipline, but not as a specialist. You can work as a GP with a special interest. If you don't want to do the training again in the UK, so let me go back and answer the question properly. Most likely, if you provide the appropriate evidence and the appropriate portfolio, and that's a paper work, paper exercise, if you provide this, they will accept it. However, I cannot guarantee this because I don't know what training you had in your medical specialty. Do you see what I mean? And it depends on different training programs. I'm talking about this all after finishing the PLAB, not before the PLAB. Okay, so step number one is finishing the PLAB exam. Because even if you're the, the best professor in your discipline in Turkey, they cannot consider you a doctor before you finish the PLAB. Specialty is something different. They don't consider you a doctor. Do you see what I'm saying? You need to be accredited as a doctor first in the UK, and then they look at your specialty. So let me go back. Number one, you put your portfolio for evidence, and you apply. Number two, if they say to you, you lack some procedures, you do it. Number three, you can still work with a new specialty, but not as a specialist, as a general practitioner with a special interest in that discipline in the primary care. And that's a significant income as well, S salary or revenue from the GP, because you, you see cases that are not referred to the hospital, they're referred to you to see them in the primary care. Um, chest physicians, like yourself, there's demand on them. There is a training pathway for allergists, and that's, um, I think, group one. Well, I, I can come back to you if you want to take my email address. I can provide you with the full advice from the program leader, Dr. Baptiste. So she can give you, she can send you a full advice or full information about chest uh, uh, or allergist training pathway. But in general, you can apply to become a specialist after finishing the PLAB exam. Uh, Dr. Mehmet Fatih. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation and information. And I, what, I, what I want to ask is, uh, we said the first step is PLAP, and after the end of the PLAP 2, let's say, uh, how long does it take to take a job uh, within that two years of work permit in the UK? And does it count in that two years before we get a job offer? And uh, what's the procedure after that, uh, after that two years of work permit? We should, uh, again, ask for another work permit after that two years and we can keep up the job we got in the hands or we have to start all over again and thank you yeah that's a good question guys if you do the six months program the government cannot give you the two years post six months program visa it's that that two years does not exist after two six months program but if you do the full MSc with us, which is a one year, the government will give you the two years um, work, work permit. After finishing the two years, you will have a sponsorship by the employers. 
I encourage you not to think about that because the sponsorship will come to you and people will be will be asking you to stay whether that is in the same job or you move to another job. There will be demand on you because you have experience in the UK as a doctor. You will have people fighting for you. I'm not concerned about that. You will get job sponsorship for visa from many institutions and many hospitals, even within the NHS. Does that, does that answer your question? There's no legal framework to guarantee this. If I had a legal framework to guarantee this, I would have given it to you. There isn't. But I assure you that people will fight to keep you within that job. You will be a rare individual with experience and ready to work. OK? There's a, if you allow me, um, I was asked, asked outside, can I work? within the program, within studying. Yes, you can. Within the study that you have, you can work. You can work 20 hours per week. That's legal. And there are jobs for you as well. Within the profession, within the medical profession, there is a, a rank called Physician Associate. Physician Associates is a, a job within the GP practices and within the hospitals. For those, the GPs and doctors, they rely on them to do certain aspects of, of procedures, like taking the blood pressure, or giving an injection, or uh, taking, a taking a medical history from the patient, preparing a patient for a minor procedure, for example. They're called physician associates. They don't need to be registered or licensed, and they have the, the jobs they're available for them in the UK. Again, there is demand on them. Normally, the GPs train them. So GPs train them for this. But GPs, they, pro, they prefer to have somebody like yourself to work in that position until they get the license, because you're, you're already trained. You're, you're a medical doctor. But you work under the supervision of that doctor until you get your full license. Do you see what I mean? However, we do encourage our students to focus, and I mean focus, and I say it for the third time, I mean focus on the PLAB. And do not work unless you really need it financially because we don't want you to lose focus outside the plan, outside the aim, the purpose, the aim, finish the plan as soon as possible, because that will open the door for you. So use the maximum of your time on the plan. However, if you really need to work on a one day, two days per week, you can still do that. I'll go back to questions. Thank you, Professor Amasri. Uh, I, my, my name is Dr. Özdan, and I'm a hematologist specialist in Turkey. Uh, I firstly wonder about, uh, uh, first, uh, how can our, how can we earn our money to live in UK? Firstly, for example, the first uh, six months course. You need to invest in your career. If you don't invest in it, um, it's difficult to take the first step. Investment in this sense, it means, and I have done it, guys, ladies and gentlemen, I have done it. I have done it 25 years ago, and I took the risk. It's a risk that you need to take. The first six months, first year, it's a risk. You, t you do it. You do it well, you will achieve. I had that question too many times from students. Where do we get the money from to, to do this? It's an investment. Some people, they invest with the risk. Some people, they say, well, I will do it with a minimal risk. I will go and work while I'm studying, which you can do it. 
But again, focus on your exam and reduce the risk. There are other ways of doing the PLAB exam, which again, probably less risk, but it takes longer time to do it. It takes two to three years, and you might find the job, you might not find the job after the PLAB. What we're saying to you, we we'll provide you with appropriate structured training with the guaranteed job after do it, doing it. And for that, you will need to put investment in it. So people who saved some level of investment and they want to invest in their future, this is the right place. That's what I can say. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> I have two more questions. Please. Uh, thank you. I have two more uh, questions. Uh, first of all, I have heard the agencies in UK that uh, helps doctors to find new jobs. Then you say you are like you are working like that, like agencies. No, we we don't work as an agency. You mean employment agencies? Yes, I think so. I heard just a little bit about agencies that helping doctors to find uh, hospitals to work there. Yeah, we, we're not an employment agency. Uh, we are an institution. Um, but uh, the NHS and other employers, they trust our graduates. So people who, who do have, for example, have finished the PLAB exam somewhere else, and then they come to us and say, find us a job. We can't. We don't work that way. OK, thank you. Uh, last of all, uh, I'm uh, wondering about uh, MRCP exam also is uh, what you can say about MRCP. It's it's an exam that you need to do after finishing the t IMT, and when you finish the exam, that would, will prepare you to go into a specialist training in one or two disciplines. You're a hematologist, aren't you? <laughs> yes. I mean, uh, you need to finish the exam to go. Unless you finished all your training in Turkey and you have all the portfolio, they might consider you a hematologist already and you can apply for hematologist consultant jobs directly. But you need to have your specialty registered and recognized by the GMC first. And that is something we can help you with as well. Thank you. You're most welcome. Questions? after the sort of Teşekkür ederim. E, bu kurs fiyatları Can içerisinde 15 bin pound. Neler dahil acaba? 6 aylık süreçte bu ilk soru. Can you repeat yes. the question? Tekrar edebilir misiniz? 15 bin poundluk kurs ücretine neler dahil? Yani sadece eğitim ücreti mi bu? Konaklama vesaire onları biz mi karşılıyoruz? It, it does not include accommodation. It includes uh, education, mentorship, before you start the program until you get a job. And then after you get the job, if you stay with communicating with us, we will mentor you until the next step and next step and next step. So it's a career pathway that we support you with. It does not include accommodation. Um, Accommodation in England is not, is not cheap, and it can be from 1,000 to 2,000 pounds a month. We have con con contracted with a number of ac accommodation providers in Birmingham and in Northern Ireland. In fact, in Northern Ireland, it's within the campus. It's a university campus. In Birmingham, it's a student accommodation, and we have single and family accommodation within the student accommodation and it's about 500 pounds per month so per year is about 5000 pounds but people who are interested we can send them full details so you take the email address or communicate with the the uh, um, organizers um, in northern ireland it's similar figure between five to six thousand pounds single and uh, and uh, family accommodation so that's um, that's not, that's not included in the price. Your second question? 
6 aylık eğitim sonrası 6 aylık vizemiz bitiyor ve biz ülkemize geri dönüyoruz anlaşılan. Yani bu 6 aylık eğitim sonrası iş bulma garantisi yok değil mi? Sadece 1 yıllık eğitim de var. Students who finish the six months or the one year and finish the PLAP exam, we guarantee their jobs. However, when you finish the six months program, you will return back to, to Turkey. And then within that six months program, we, will, we would have arranged interviews for you. So you will do the interviews before you leave the country. And then you come back to the job immediately because you will need a sponsorship. So we guarantee the job for you in both situations. So the six months program, you come, do the six months, and do the interviews. When you finish the plan, you get the job. So the, the guarantee is related to the plan, is not related to the is not related to the program itself. Do you see what I mean? Within the one-year full-time MSc program, because it's an MSc, you will get a guaranteed, as well as the job, you will get a guaranteed visa, so you do not need to come back to Turkey. You can stay in the UK. Do you see the difference? So you stay in the UK, you don't, need, you don't need to come back to Turkey in the one year. But we guarantee you jobs in both situations if you finish the PLAB exam. And we will put all the support for you to finish the PLAB exam. Or the UK MLA, when it, when it happens. Any other question? Disadvantage for? Um, for newly graduates who haven't started work as doctors. Yes. Um, it's a good question. So if you haven't done any work in Turkey yet, we advise you to do one year experience in Turkey because that one year experience would basically count towards your requirement to enter into the special, specialty training in the IMT or the specialist uh, or the specialty training for the GP. However, we know many of the people who did not do this and they came straight to the UK and after finishing the lab exam, they managed to get a one year experience by a trainee, by foundation, so foundation training. That foundation training is less income, but it can happen in the UK. So there is a way for you if you want to do the foundation training or that one year experience in the UK after you finish the lab. Okay. Thank you. I also wanted to ask, is the exam fee included in the uh, course fee? Is the? Exam fee for clubs included in the course fee. Um, exam fees for the PLAB, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't remember how much is that. It's a few hundred pounds. I don't remember how much is that, to be honest. But I can get you the full information about the exam fee. There is exam fee. Again, we're negotiating now with the GMC that we will provide the exam in our college. So we will become an examination center for the GMC as well. Thank you. Başka soru var mıdır? Ön tarafta bir sorumuz var. Merhaba, ismim Doktor Ali. Altı. One second, please. Bir saniye. Buyurun. İsmim Doktor Ali. Altı aylık kurslarımız Şubat ayından sonra da devam edecek mi? Yoksa sadece bir şey istedim. Say that again, please. Say that again, please. Uh, İsmim Doktor Ali. Altı aylık kurslarınız uh, Şubat ayından sonra da devam edecek mi? Yoksa sadece bir seferde mi? Aslında bir şey yok mu? 
it will continue, it will repeat itself. So February, September, February, September. You're welcome. Hello. Hello. My name is Dr. Shepard Jawas. Uh, I am working as, you know, complementary medicine like uh, acupuncture, ozotherapy, homeopathy. Uh, after passing the lab exam, uh, can we work in UK as complementary doctors like acupuncture, homeopathy and uh, ozotherapy? Yeah. You can do all medical practice in the UK if you pass, pass the exam. So alternative medicine, I hear about it in the UK. There's something that it's happening within the private sector. From my knowledge and experience, it does not exist in the, in, in the NHS. Um, the relevant question you might ask me, can you do that without PLAB or without registration in the GMC? And the answer to this is, I do not think so. No. Uh, if I finish PLAB, after that I work as complementary doctor for acupuncture. Can I work legally there in UK? You can. Uh, thank you. You can open a so practice for this. Sir, it, for it also we need to finish the PLAB for complementary. We need to finish first plan. You need to finish the plan first, okay. and Thank then you can open on. Uh, you can open a practice for this, or you can work in another practice for alternative medicine. Okay. It's not a job. It's not within the NHS. Thank it's you. private practice. Hello, uh, thank you for your presentation. I'm just a little bit confused about uh, IAMT. Uh, I'm an OBGYN specialist in Turkey. And do I still have to pass the internal medicine training? Or uh, if I uh, make my portfolio? So you're a specialist already in yes. therapy? Yes. Okay. What speci specialty? Uh, OBGYN, obstetrics so and gynecology. So I'm, I'm a surgeon. <laughs> so you're a surgeon? Yeah. Yeah. IMT is not for surgery. IMT is for, it's it's, for medicine, yeah, it's medical specialties. But surgical specialties, they have similar se sector as well. They have similar scheme, so you will need to do uh, surgical training for that. So do I have to pass them or? One minute. Okay. If I say to you, yes, you need to do it, I will be unfair to you. And if I say to you, no, you don't need to do it, I will not be providing the accurate answer to this. It's all dependent on your portfolio of evidence. Many people who are surgeons now, they are not trained in the UK. They have done surgical training somewhere else. They came, they've done the PLAB exam first, and then they collected their portfolio of evidence, the syllabus and the training curriculum that you had, and your portfolio of clinical cases and what you have done in your clinical training the number of cases in each area. You have this portfolio translated, you bring it, you apply and say to the GMC, I am already a specialist and this is my evidence. The majority of cases they will accept it and you will be considered a specialist. They might ask you to sit an exam in the Royal College of Surgeons, so you don't need to do all of the training but you sit an exam, it's called an exit exam. And the exit exam is to become a, uh, a consultant. So if you, if you sit the exam and you become a consultant, that's fine. You are similar to any other trainee who's finished the training pathway in the, in the UK. So in that case, no. But I would not be able to tell until somebody from the GMC will look at your portfolio of evidence. And that is different from one institution to another. It depends on where you have done your training and how comprehensive is the evidence that you will provide. Some institutions, they provide with a very small syllabus that is not enough for the GMC to judge. 
So it's not only the final degree that you provide or the final certificate of specialization in Turkey. It's dependent on the, the evidence that you provide to the GMC. And some curriculum or syllabus is really full details. With that full details, the GMC would like to see that you have done that, you have done this. The por full portfolio is, is evident there. And then they will accept it. Thank you. You're welcome. But be prepared if you, if you have training somewhere else, be prepared to be asked to write, to, to do an exam in the UK for a specialty as well. Because things keep changing every year. Which is good as well, so you don't need to do first full surgical training. Başka soru var mıdır? Ön tarafta bir sorumuz daha var. Doktor Tuncer sunumumuz için teşekkür ediyoruz. Bir saniye lütfen. Buyurun. Doktor Tuncer sunumumuz için teşekkürler. NHS'te çalışmak için bir üst yaş sınırı var mı? Bu, bu konuda bir sınırlama var mı? Onu verelim istiyorum. No. Um, we we are we are as young as the others, so we can work together. So it's fine. I am as young as you, and you are as young as myself, and the NHS will accept us both. So uh, no no age limit. Hello, you. Uh, one of my colleagues. Uh, asked you about uh, re rejection about uh, after club exams. What's the most common reasons for that? Uh, rejection for after rejection for jobs, you mean? Yes, job. Uh... It's not rejection. It's not rejection. It's they do not they do not prefer people who finished the club exam while they didn't have any experience in the UK. Because of all the orientation matters that I said, so it's not only a matter of PLAP. It's about uh, this, you have not gone through a structured training to reorient you towards a UK practice. So you're not a safe doctor. From communication skills, from medical legal aspects, from governance, from all other aspects. You, you know how to do medicine, but you don't know how to practice in the UK. But within our program, you will learn all of this, so you will be similar to any UK graduate. And that's why we guarantee your job. Does that make sense? Başka sorumuz var mıdır salonda? Peki, zannediyorum ki sorumuz yok. Professor, thanks a lot for all the information you have shared. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for listening to me on a Sunday afternoon. And um, I wish you all the best. And I, I hope to see you again, if not in Turkey, in, in, in the UK. And uh, I hope to, that we can have the chance to provide training for you and for your colleagues and uh, have a um, continuous relationship with yourselves. Thank you for the organizers of this event. Thank you for the translators. Thank you very much. And uh, good to see you guys. Thank you. Değerli hekimlerimiz, katılımınız için teşekkürler. Umuyoruz ki sorularınızın hepsi cevaplandı. Eğer daha fazla sorunuz varsa lütfen broşürdeki iletişim kanallarından iletişime geçin. Ekibimiz size yardımcı olmaktan memnuniyet duyacaktır. Hoşçakalın.